Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. You are the only person in this relationship you can change. You can inspire your partner, but if you give up on your relationship, you're really giving up on you. If you say, what's the use? It's never going to change. You need to take it out of there and put in I. What's the use? I will never change. There is no it. There's only I. If you no longer even bother to protest, if you're attacked or abused by your partner, you've given up on you. If you think it's pointless to try to change because it will only make the other party get angry, then you've given up on you. It's Dr. Phil. You found your way to fill in the blanks, and we're in the middle of our series, Relationship Reality Check, subtitled, How Much Fun Are You to Live With? How much fun are you to live with? And you know, we've been talking about what not to do in a relationship. We've been talking about myths, blowing those things up. We've been talking about your bad spirit, those things that will contaminate a relationship and drag it down. And you heard me say, relationships are ships, and ships go down. But now it's time to start talking about what to do. I've cautioned you about what not to do, but anybody can say what not to do. Anybody can criticize. Anybody can find fault. But what do you do? How do you make your relationship sing? As we've talked about doing a reality check on your relationship, One of the key things I've said is that you either contribute to or contaminate your relationship. There is no neutrality. And I hope what you've done, rather than just listen to me ramble on here, is really stop and ask yourself some questions. Because my intention has been to be thought-provoking here. You know, when you watch Dr. Phil, I'm talking to people, I'm talking to couples, I'm talking to families, I'm talking to individuals about their specific story. And I really hope that when I do that, you're able to take something away from those stories that you can use in your own life. But here in Relationship Reality Check, I've set the stories to the side, and I'm talking to you specifically about things that you can plug in to your own life and your own relationship. I hope it's been thought-provoking to the extent that when you come away, you've asked yourself, Is the bad spirit that we've talked about active in my life? Has my bad spirit taken me over? When I say you either contribute to or contaminate your relationship, I hope you step back and say, which is it for me? Am I a contributor? Do I bring good things to the relationship or am I a contaminator? I've got luggage. I've got baggage. I've got a history that puts a chip on my shoulder and I bring it to the relationship and contaminate with it. I do hope you ask yourself that, because you've heard me say you cannot change what you do not acknowledge. That's life law number four. You cannot change what you do not acknowledge. If you're a contaminator, you can't stop contaminating if you don't acknowledge that you're a contaminator, and you cannot stop contaminating if you don't start contributing. Now think about what I just said. You've heard me say that you don't break habits. You actually replace one behavior with a new behavior that's incompatible with the one you don't want. And that's the same thing about contaminating. If you want to stop contaminating your relationship, then start contributing to your relationship because that's a whole new set of behaviors that is inconsistent, incompatible with contaminating it. If you're doing positive things that contribute to your relationship, then you can't be contaminating it. And what I'm telling you today, what I'm turning to today in Relationship Reality Check, how much fun are you to live with, is it's time to get back to you. Have you stopped lately and asked yourself, do you know why your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife, whatever it may be, fell in love with you to begin with? Stop and think about that. Now, for me, I met Robin 48 years ago, 48 years ago. That's a long time. I mean, gas was like 30 cents a gallon. Think about that. That's how long ago that was. And it does a body good to turn back the clock and think, 
why did somebody choose you for their life partner? If it was 48 years ago, 30 years ago, two years ago, why did they choose you? What was it about you that lit them up? What was it about you that made them say, wow, I want to be with this person? And all false humility aside, I want you to get out a piece of paper and write down why your partner chose to spend the rest of their life with you. What was it? And be realistic about it. Like I say, all false humility aside, for me, it wasn't that she loved running her fingers through my hair. I know that for damn sure, because I was bald then, just like I am now. But what was it? Were you fun? Did you make your partner feel safe? Did you make your partner feel special? Did you make your partner feel valued? Did you make your partner feel like they were a worthy, valid human being? Were you interesting? Were you intriguing? What was it that made your partner fall in love with you? If you can't answer that question, then you need to hit pause and stop listening to me until you can answer that question. Really think about it. And there's a reason I want you to think about it. I want you to get back to you. If you can't figure out why she fell in love with you, why he fell in love with you to begin with, then you don't have an anchor point. You don't have anything to get back to. And I want you to ask yourself, can I get back to me? Can I get back to the me that my partner fell in love with? And you may think, well, my partner's still in love with me. Dr. Phil, you're assuming that I'm in the ditch here. No. No, I'm not. But nobody is above improvement. Maybe your relationship is in the ditch. Maybe that's why you're listening to this series that I've put together. Maybe it's just gone stale. Maybe you've just kind of become roommates and you take each other for granted and the sizzle's gone. You know, I did say there was a difference between falling in love and being in love. There's a difference between getting butterflies in your stomach every time the person walks in the room and a comfortable love that you feel safe and secure in. Maybe you don't have either one of those. Maybe it's just roommates and not very good ones. Maybe it's actually deteriorated into open hostility. Maybe you blame each other for your position in life. I don't know your particular situation, but I do know this. I've never met a couple that couldn't improve. So yeah, I'm asking you, can you get back to you? Can you get back to the you that your partner fell in love with? Have you lost yourself? Have you gotten so caught up in being a husband or wife, a boyfriend or girlfriend, a partner, half of a couple, that you lost all of who you are? Because if you can't be 100% of who you are and be half of a couple at the same time, something's gone wrong. You should be able to be an individual and still be half of a couple. If you lose your individuality, the price is too high. The relationship is dysfunctional. You've got to reclaim who you are, and that's who your partner fell in love with. And you can say, well, I got that beat out of me. My partner took that away from me. Well, no, they didn't. I'll get to that in a minute. But they didn't fall in love with who you are now. They fell in love with who you were then. So don't we need to get back to that? Robin and I joke sometimes. She'll say, you know, I wish you were more sensitive or I I wish you were more emotional. And I said, well, you married a linebacker. Doesn't mean I can't work to be those things, but you kind of knew who I was when you married me. I was pretty cerebral and had a pretty violent job at the time. I mean, that's who I was and what I did. I mean, I was a jock. I was a jock then. I'm a jock now. I mean, it's 48 years later and I do sports every day, seven days a week. I did them then. I do them now. It's who I am. And she has been so supportive in me being who I am. She really has not tried to change me into being who she might at different times think she wishes I was. Now, look, that doesn't mean you can't modify yourself. You can't grow. You can't evolve. Certainly you can. My God, we've been married 43 years. That has not been one year 43 times over. We've been married a second year, a third year, a fourth year, a fifth year, and the fifth year wasn't like the first year, and the tenth year wasn't like the fifth year. We have evolved. 
you don't ever want to have one year's experience 43 times. You want each year to build on the one before. So, of course, you evolve, but you never lose your roots. You never lose your identity. And when I say get back to you, I want you to make a commitment to yourself that you're going to live with integrity, honesty, compassion, and you're going to do it in a way that you generate enthusiasm, that you're your own best friend. Now, your partner's going to be your best friend as well, but you've got to be a good friend to yourself. You know, I always tell people, you're the easiest person to tell yourself no. You're the easiest person to say no to. You know, you could make a dentist appointment. You can make an appointment to meet somebody for lunch. You can make an appointment to see a therapist. You can make an appointment to do 10 different things. And when it comes time to have me time, you've got five things to do that day. Time runs short. Who's the easiest person to cancel on? You. You're the easiest person to cancel on, right? It's easier to cancel on yourself than it is to call the dentist and say, I'm not coming. It's easier to tell yourself, well, I'll just do this tomorrow instead of, calling your therapist and say, I'm not coming, or calling your mother and say, well, I'm not going to come over and see you. It's easier to tell yourself no. It shouldn't be, but it is, because then you avoid confrontation. And what I'm saying is, if you're your own best friend, then you won't cancel on you. You wouldn't cancel lunch with your best friend if they were counting on it. And if you're your own best friend, then you wouldn't cancel on you. You wouldn't cancel things that are important to you. You wouldn't settle for less. You wouldn't settle for living with less than integrity and honesty and compassion and enthusiasm. Hi, this is Rachel Yucatel, and I'm here to invite you to listen to my podcast, Misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. This podcast delves into the lives of those who have been reduced to a single headline. Each episode will take a closer look at the stories of those who are on a mission to change their narrative. Join me as we uncover the truth behind the misconceptions, shed light on the stories of those who have perhaps been wrongfully portrayed, explore the complexities of the human experience, and celebrate the power of second chances. Who doesn't love a good comeback story? There are over 90,000 people missing at any time, and over half a million are reported missing every year. And that's just in the United States. I'm Mike Morford. And I'm Jess Betancourt. And in our podcast, Missing Persons, we discuss cases of people who have gone missing under mysterious circumstances. And we're joined in each episode by guests who are either related to the missing person, investigating their disappearance, or advocating for answers in the case. Missing Persons is available everywhere you listen to podcasts, and there are dozens of episodes to binge on right now. Subscribe today so you don't miss an episode. So we talked about the bad spirit. I want to talk about the good spirit. I want to talk about the things that you can do to make your relationship better. And the first one is to own your relationship. Own your relationship. You are not a victim. You can say, well, I'm married to a jerk. I'm in a relationship with somebody that's just impossible. I'm a victim here. Dr. Phil, you don't know this person. They're impossible. They're the most miserable human being on the face of the earth. This is ground zero for miserable. I'm married to the worst person in the world. They find something wrong with everything. Well, okay, that's your victim story. But you've got to own that relationship. You created this relationship. You picked this person. And whatever is going on in this relationship, you either elicited it, maintain it, or allow it. You're not a victim. You either elicit, maintain, or allow what's going on in your relationship. You are the architect of your thoughts, your thought patterns, your behaviors. Whatever your partner's bad habits are, you need to ask yourself, what do you do to pay them off for that? If they are constantly late, if you're going somewhere, you're meeting someone for dinner, or you have a reservation somewhere, and they are chronically late, I mean, it's a fight every time. You make a reservation somewhere, you're going to be there at 7.30, and 7.30, you're ready to go, and they're not, and you leave at 8.15 every time, and so you are mad every time, you are arguing every time. You need to ask yourself what you're doing to elicit, maintain, or allow that behavior, because you are not a victim. You are doing something to enable that behavior. You are paying them off for that behavior. So instead of asking yourself, what is wrong with them that they do this, you need to ask yourself, what am I doing to reinforce this behavior on their part? Look at your role. Now, you may say, look, why are you blaming this on me? I'm not the one that's late. I'm not blaming it on you. I'm saying you're the only one you have control over. You're the only one that you have input to. You need to own your relationship. Take off the victim hat, put it on the shelf, 
and become an owner, an owner of your relationship. If your partner is just unplugged, what are you doing that elicits, maintains, or allows that? How are you paying them off for being unplugged? Are you allowing them to be lazy? Are you failing to engage? Have you given up? What are you doing to enable that behavior? Enable means I make it easier for them to do something by my conduct. Own your relationship. You're not a victim. What are you doing to elicit that behavior? What are you doing to maintain it? What are you doing to allow it? Take control. Confront the situation. Own your relationship. Quit blaming your partner for it and own it. If you're so smart, if you're so right, then why can't you fix it? You can. You can fix it by owning it. What's the second thing you can do? You can accept the risk of being vulnerable. Now, this is really important. If your relationship is not working exactly the way you want it to, then you've gone into protective mode. You put your dukes up. You got your fist out in front of you. You're ready to fight because you don't trust your partner. They've hurt you. And so you start playing the what-if game. Well, I'm not going to expose myself. I'm going to let myself feel again, love again, be exposed again. Because what if they betray me again? What if they lie to me again? What if they cheat on me again? What if they get cold on me again? What if I do what you're saying, Dr. Phil? What if I become vulnerable again? What if I put it on the line again and they let me down again? Look, I really don't mind you playing the what-if game in a relationship. I really don't. As long as you play it out to the end. If you're going to ask the question, what if? What if they betray me? What if they lie to me? What if they let me down? Okay, I don't mind you playing that game. As long as you answer the question. If you say, what if they let me down? Then answer the damn question. What if they do? Are you going to explode? Are there going to be hair, teeth, and eyes all over the wall? Are you just going to explode because they lied to you again? Well, no. Of course you're not. You didn't last time. Did it hurt? Yes. Were you upset? Yes. Are you still here? Yes. Did you die? No. I've told you before two things. Number one, never invest more than you can afford to lose. I hear these things. People say, it just devastated me. It just killed me. No, it didn't. It didn't devastate you. It didn't kill you. It just broke my heart. No, it didn't. It hurt you. But it didn't kill you. You know how I know it didn't kill you? Because you're still listening to me. You're not dead. You're still here. The other thing I've told you is that language is very powerful. If you use words like horrible, devastated, killed, those come with a lot of power. So it's just horrible. You know, she lied to me. She cheated me. It just destroyed me. It just devastated me. Well, no, it didn't. Your kidneys are still working. Your heart's still beating. You're upset. It hurts your feelings. And two years from now, you'll be with somebody and you'll look back and say, oh, my God, if she hadn't cheated on me, I'd have never met this person who I am head over heels in love with. It's funny how things work. If the person hadn't cheated on me and left me, that I'd have never met this person that I love more than life itself. So that was actually a blessing. I'm so glad that happened because now I've met this person. Does it hurt? Yes. Is it okay? No, it's not okay. I'm not trying to trivialize it. Nothing matters. Yes, it matters. Of course it matters. Does it have gravity? Yes, it has gravity. But it's bad enough without you catastrophizing it with your language. Accept the risk of vulnerability. If you say, what if... I say, okay, I'm, I'm going to get emotionally invested again. I'm going to approach them again. I'm going to show affection again. I'm, I'm going to engage again. What if they just turn a cold shoulder to me again? Well, okay, what if they do? Then you'll try something else. Or maybe you'll eventually have enough and say, that's it. I'm out of here. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life beating my head against the wall. But you will survive. Accept the risk of vulnerability and accept the fact that you will survive. The third thing you've got to do is accept your partner. And that means you've got to stop focusing on the negatives. You've got to take the chip off your shoulder. You have to realize that you don't have to react to everything you can react to. 
just because they do something that you can justify being upset about, you can justify being hurt about, you can justify being wounded by, doesn't mean you have to be. You know, you can make a joke out of it. You can choose to tease them about it. Pain is the price that you pay for resisting the natural order of things. There is a natural order of things. There's just a certain way people are going to be. Like I've said, Robin's very emotional. I love that about her. She's so much fun in that regard, and she gets so excited about things. It just fills up the room, and it's great when our kids were growing up, and it's great now with our grown kids and our grandkids. She gets so excited about things, and it just brings a texture to life that's really, really nice. I'm much more cerebral. I just kind of think about things and I might have a great sense of satisfaction inside, but I don't do the happy dance like Snoopy in the Peanuts cartoons. She'll sometimes turn around and say, give me something. Come on. I mean, it's like you won the lottery or something. Give me something. Jump up and down. Throw caution to the wind and break into a smile. She teases me about it. But she doesn't resist the natural order of things because she knows that that's just the way I am. I'm kind of reserved in that way. I was raised by an alcoholic father in a very combative situation, and I kind of have emotions that are a little more constricted. That's just the natural order of things. So she knows that, and she'll redo something in the house and say, okay, come in and look at this. All right, close your eyes. Now, open your eyes. What do you think? And I'll look at it and say, oh, yeah, I think I might like this. It's like, oh, God, do you like it or do you not? Well, after about 10 years, she's learned it'll take about a week for him to kind of think about it and look at it and live with it a while. And he'll sit in the room a while, look around and stuff. And then, you know, in about a week, he'll tell me, I really like this. This really feels good. I really like this. And when he says it, he'll really mean it. But he's not going to just jump up and down and go, oh, wow, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen in my whole life. That's just not the natural order of things for me. And she's been great about accepting that. So ask yourself, do you accept your partner and their natural way of being in the world? And you You don't have to love everything about somebody to love them. You can love what they do in certain situations and not love what they do in others, but you can still love them. I love that she gets so excited about things. And if by my yardstick it would be too excited, that's just by my yardstick. It's not by hers. So I accept her and her emotionality, and she accepts me and my analytical approach. And between us, it's a pretty good balance. So ask yourself, what can I do to accept my partner and the natural order of things the way they naturally are, instead of criticizing the fact that they aren't the way you are? Because like I said, Robin's very different from me. I don't want her to be just like me. I did not want our kids to grow up with two me's. I wanted them to grow up with a Robin and a Phil. And I certainly didn't want to be married to me. I don't want to be married to somebody that looks at things the way I look at them, thinks about things the way I look at them, reacts to things the way I react to them. How boring would that be if you were married to somebody that thought, felt, acted, reacted exactly the way you do. God, how boring would that be? That'd be terrible. You don't want that. You want them to be different. So accept your partner. Find things about them that you can focus on that are positive. Now, the fourth thing is going to seem like it should be the easiest thing of all, but I'll bet it's the thing that you're probably worst at. And that is, if you want to do something to improve your relationship, work on being a friend. Work on friendship. We've all seen the headlines in the news of how someone lost their life in an act of cold-blooded murder. And while it's sad and grabs your attention, most people go on with their day without giving it another thought. But have you ever stopped to think about the life of the person at the center of the news story? They were more than just a headline or a statistic. They were someone's loved one or friend. I'm Mike Morford, and my podcast, The Murder of My Family, dives into some of those stories to help listeners get to know the person who was lost and how their death affected those closest to them. Listen to The Murder of My Family everywhere you listen to podcasts. There are well over 100 episodes to binge on now.
I'm Katie Maloney, 37, a divorcee, and I'm out here falling in love every day with myself. And I'm Dana Kathan, 33, former needy mess and delusional Leo, but I've never been happier. Never been happier. You know that. Good. (laughs) The foundation of this podcast is for people who want to live their life unapologetically. It's a safe space for anyone who's going through a transition in their life or just dealing with the regular bullshit. It's a religion. We're not saying that we're looking to start a coven, but that might be why we started this podcast. I'm not saying that. Join our cult. I mean, community. I mean, the coven. Religion. Let's just stick with community. Listen to the podcast. Listen to the podcast. (laughs) You gotta be friends with your partner. Let's think about what that means. I'm betting that most married relationships, most committed relationships, most long-term relationships that are kind of in the ditch are probably problem-driven. You remember a few weeks ago, I talked about the first four minutes? I said, come in, and for four minutes, don't talk about problems. For four minutes, how are you? How was your day? You look nice. The house looks great. Let me tell you something Billy did today that was just absolutely hilarious, or how proud I was of what Susie did at school today, or great news today from my mom, or something. Just Positive, positive, positive for four minutes. And you're going to find sometimes that it's hard to fill up four minutes without bitching about something. And the harder it is, the more you need to do it. Most relationships that are off in the ditch are problem-driven. You guys deal with problems together. You just do. That's your favorite topic. But if you want your relationship to be better, you need to be better friends. And what do friends do? Now, think about a friend that you have maybe at work or in the neighborhood somewhere that you went to school with, and you see each other from time to time. What do friends do? Friends see each other, they laugh, they cut up, they talk about common interest. Maybe it's sports or some TV series they're both watching, or maybe they talk about politics or whatever. They might tell each other a joke or laugh about something they saw on the internet. Friends invest energy in each other. They don't just bring problems to each other or they stop seeing each other. Friends talk about positive things. And what I have observed is that couples often invest less energy into their relationship with each other than they do with people that they casually know at work. They'll pass each other in the hall at home. Ugh. Ugh. But they go in at work, hey, Bob, how's it going? Hey, Carol, what's up? How was your night? But they'll pass their significant other in the kitchen at home and go, ugh. That's all the energy they'll put into it at home with the most significant other person in their life, but then go to work with somebody that they barely know and say, hey, how are you? You sure look nice today. I love that coat. And they won't even put that much energy in with the most significant person in their life. How illogical is that? So I'm asking you to invest at least as much energy into your significant other as you do with strangers or casual acquaintances at work or the mall. I've seen people invest more energy into a clerk at the grocery store than they do their partner at home. How insane is that? Number five, I want you to go beyond being a friend with your partner. I want you to make a conscious decision to promote your partner's self-esteem. Promote your partner's self-esteem. Now, let's think about what self-esteem means, because we use that word a lot, but nobody ever really defines it. Self-esteem. How well does one regard themselves? How proud of themselves are they? How much do they like themselves? How much confidence do they have? You know, how good do they feel about themselves? There's something that we refer to in psychology sometimes. It's called the health-engendering personality. You can look this up if you want to and read about it. It's a thing. Health-engendering personality. I have a really long-time dear friend that has the best health-engendering personality I may have ever encountered, and that's Oprah. I've known Oprah since, oh gosh, I guess 96, so coming up on 20, 3, 4, 5 years. And I have watched her. I've experienced it myself. I watched her with, I don't know, a thousand other people, hundreds of other people one-on-one over all those years. 
And it doesn't make any difference whether it's with a president of the United States, a senator, a janitor cleaning up in the studio as we're leaving, a parking lot attendant, a waiter in a restaurant, whatever. She has this ability that whenever she interacts with someone, they feel better about who they are when they get through talking to her. She just has this way of engaging them, focusing on them in a way that they walk away feeling better about who they are and what they have to offer in this life than they did before they walked up and engaged with her. And it's not just that they have a glow about they got to talk to Oprah. You know, everybody would be excited that they got to talk to Oprah Winfrey. I mean, come on. Who doesn't like Oprah? People would be excited about talking to her. But it's not that. It's more than that. It's that they have a deeply personal experience in talking with her, and she impacts them in a way that they walk away with their shoulders back and their head held a little higher, feeling good about who they are and where they are in this world. Now, some people just do that naturally. It's just a quality that they have, and I suspect Oprah was that way in grade school. She was probably that way in college. She's certainly been that way for the 25 years that I've known her, and I suspect that's why she was one of the most clarion voices, if not the clarion voice in the history of television. I think that's why millions of people flock to watch her every day, because they would just watch her and hear what she had to say and share in the stories that she presented, and they just felt better about themselves. That's what I want you to do with your partner. I want you to make a conscious decision that whatever your interaction is going to be with your partner, you're going to do it in such a way that they feel better about who they are after talking to you than they did before they started. That some way, somehow during that conversation, you're going to validate that person. You're going to honor that person. You're going to make them know that you're proud of them and that they should be proud of themselves. You're going to find something about them that you can comment on, focus on, single out, mirror back to them, reflect on, that is a positive about them. Maybe it's their looks, their grooming, the way they presented something, how they carry themselves, the idea or comment that they had to make, whatever it is, but you're going to interact with them in a way that they can't possibly walk away from you and not feel better about who they are. It doesn't mean that you have to agree with what they say. That's not what I'm saying. That's playing the nice guy. Playing the nice guy can really cheat a person. It can really be condescending. That's not what I'm talking about. You can disagree with someone. You can fire someone from their job, and they can walk away feeling better about themselves than they did before they walked up. And you're probably thinking, now, okay, you lost me there. How are you going to do that? How are you going to fire somebody, and they're going to feel better about themselves than they did before they walked up? Well. You might have to focus on their good qualities. You might have to focus about the contribution they've made while they're there, how painful it's going to be to have to let them go, the fact that they don't fit the organization and how unique their talent is and how special they are and how strongly you believe in them and are going to help them moving forward and comment on the positive things that they've done while they were there, whatever you can find to comment on about them. And of course, that's the ultimate stretch. And I'm not saying when you break up with somebody, you don't give them the old, hey, it's me, not you. You know, that doesn't fly. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about whether you're checking out of the grocery store with a clerk, whether you're talking to your children, whether you're engaging with a friend. And it isn't always about paying people a compliment. One of the most powerful things you can do for people to feel better about themselves is to give them your absolute undivided attention. Stop what you're doing. Don't look at your phone. Put your phone down. Put it in your pocket. Look them in the eye. Here's a unique thought. Look them in the eye. Engage with them. Be 100% present when you're talking to them. Ask questions about what they're saying. Follow up with what they're saying. Show an interest in what they have to say. 
be engaged, be 100% fully present. People's favorite topic is themselves. Sorry, it just is. People's favorite topic is themselves. Somebody can come up and talk to you, you look them in the eye, they tell you something that's going on, you ask a few questions and follow up, and say, well, you know, thanks for sharing that. Now, if you've got just a minute, tell me about you. How are you doing? Tell me what's going on in your life. Well, tell me about that. That is so interesting. Thanks for sharing that with me. I appreciate you taking the time to share that with me. Just show an interest in them, a curiosity about them, and then listen intently. Be 100% present when you're talking to that person. There is nothing more rude than somebody to be talking to you and telling you something particularly personal, and you're reading your phone. I go into these restaurants, and I see people on their phone the entire time, standing on the street. Who are they talking to? If they need to be somewhere else, why are they here? If whoever they're texting with or emailing or talking to on the phone is so important, why are they not there instead of here? If you need to talk to this person so badly, I will be happy to excuse you. You can call an Uber or something and go over there and be with them and text me. I don't know. But it's so rude. Be with your partner. If your spouse comes in the room and you're watching TV, Here's a thought. Pause the TV. Turn it off. Pause it. I've I've actually seen this in the last week. A husband at the breakfast bar in the kitchen watching TV, and his wife came and started talking to him, and he turned up the volume. He's like, okay, you're going to talk to me. I'm going to turn up the volume. Why did he just hit her in the head, throw water in her face or something? How rude. I thought, oh, my God. I need to get out of here. He actually turned up the volume to drown her out. She did not walk away feeling better about who she was. I mean, that's like the worst. The only thing he could have done was then pick up his phone and start texting someone. Be 100% present. Look him in the eye. Be engaged. Show an interest in what they're talking about. Ask a follow-up question and ask about them. That makes people feel valid that there's something there. And number six, you're just going to have to be honest with yourselves about this. You've got to air your frustrations in the right direction, and that is opposed to non-directional venting. And here's what I mean by that. Look, your day is full of frustrations, right? And so what we tend to do, and this is what drives the first four-minute comment that I made earlier, is we come home and we vent to our partners. We vent to our mates. Maybe we're frustrated at work. We didn't get the raise that we asked for. We didn't get the promotion that we wanted. Or there's somebody at work that is just annoying and irritating. Or the kids have just been impossible that day. And then you get with your partner and you're just so frustrated you could eat a tin can. And so you just start venting at them, venting all that frustration. And you're just putting them on blast. They didn't do a damn thing. Why are you venting at them? Because they're handy. They're handy as a pocket on a shirt. You've got all this frustration, all this resentment, all of this pent-up frustration, rage, and here is a target. And you may think, well, that's what partners are for. No, 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 it's not. That's not what they're for. That is not what they're for at all. And your job is to sort out the sources of your frustration. If you have a frustration with your partner, then you can deal with that with your partner after the first four minutes. But if you've got frustrations at work, then deal with them at work. If you've got frustrations with your brother or your sister or your mother or your father or your kids or your golf game or something, then deal with that there. Don't vent to your partner. Don't take it out on your partner. You've had a tough day at work. Don't come home and browbeat your partner because you didn't have the guts to say it to your boss. This is a huge deal. I can't tell you how much this happens in relationships. And if you would stop doing that, you would be astounded how much angst would disappear in your relationship. Aim your frustrations in the right direction. Air them out where they happen. Don't deal with them all at home. Look, there's a lot of frustration in life. There's financial pressures, there's job pressures, 
And if you got a job, you got pressures. If you got a job without pressure, you don't have a job. You're just going down there and somebody's paying you. If you got a job without pressure, then seriously, <laughs> you don't really have a job. So there's going to be pressure, and it's going to build up, and you're going to want to vent it. You just don't go home and vent it. And you say, well, now, wait a minute. I feel If I can't go home and talk to my partner, what kind of relationship is that? Well, don't put words in my mouth. I didn't say you can't go home and talk to your partner. I said you cannot go home and vent frustrations that your partner has nothing to do with on your partner. Deal with that where it happens. You're frustrated with a teacher at school about your kid? Handle that with your teacher. If you're frustrated with your supervisor at work, handle that with your supervisor. Wherever your frustration is born, deal with it there. And then you can come home and say, oh, man, I was so frustrated today at work, and I dealt with it. So sure glad I got a soft place to fall. Let's go sit on the patio and relax a minute. That's a whole lot better than coming home and just putting your partner on blast. Now, listen, I'm not making this stuff up. I've been doing this for 45 years. I've seen this over and over and over and over again. So I'm saying aim your frustrations in the right direction. Number seven, I'm going to talk about the frustrations that are associated with your partner. Because number seven, you want a good relationship, you need to be upfront and forthright with your partner. If you do have frustrations with your partner, and I guarantee you, you are going to have frustrations with your partner. As charming and wonderful as I am, I'll guarantee you Robin has had frustrations with me over the years. I've often said we've been married 43 years, and I'm sure some of those felt like dog years to her because we are different, and I'm sure I've frustrated her no end at times. You need to have emotional integrity. When Robin and I were first dating, she got upset with me about something, and she hadn't said anything other than one or two word responses for about three or four hours. So, being the clever and perceptive person I am, I thought, yeah, something's not right here. <laughs> so, I went in the other room and said, uh, what's wrong? And she said, nothing. <laughs> and I said, okay. And the translation was, plenty, bucko, and it's you. I said, okay. Uh, just hang on a minute. Let's have a conversation here. I'll make you a deal. I would much rather you just tell me straight up, here's what you did. I don't like it. I mean, just tell me, and we can deal with it. I mean, I know you're eventually going to tell me. So why waste two and a half days, and then you tell me? Why don't you just tell me now? We can deal with it, and then we can enjoy the next two and a half days. To which she said, well, that's fine, Mr. Cerebral, but maybe I don't feel like talking about it right now. I said, okay, then tell me that. But don't say nothing. When it's something, just say, I don't feel like talking about it right now. We'll talk about it later. But let's at least put it on the table. Let's be honest. I mean, I don't want to be standing there guessing. Just tell me. Let's be honest. You don't have to talk about things on my schedule or my terms or ever, for that matter. I don't get to set your clock. You talk about when you want, if you want. But let's at least be honest with each other. So if you don't want to talk about it, then just say, yeah, there is something bothering me. I just don't want to talk about it right now, which I thought was a pretty good speech. And she said, okay, sounds good. Yeah, there is something wrong. I don't want to talk about it right now, so leave me alone. I said, okay. And about 15, 20 minutes later, she came in and told me what it was. We talked about it, resolved it, and we laughed about it later that day and just decided that we would deal with things as they came up instead of letting them build up. That was really important for our relationship. We just agreed we're going to be upfront and forthright and have emotional integrity. So if I said, is there something wrong with you? She wasn't going to say no, if there really was. And same thing, if she asked me, are you upset about something? I'd say, yeah, I, yes, I am. I wasn't going to say no deny it or whatever, when in fact, that's not the case. And both of us reserved the right to talk about it when we felt like talking about it, which I think to our credit was generally either right then or pretty soon thereafter. But anger is nothing more than an outward manifestation of hurt, fear, and frustration. So if your partner is angry, if they're showing you anger, look behind the anger. 
that's a protective mechanism. What they're really experiencing is hurt, fear, frustration, or all three. And if you give them an opportunity, they'll tell you about that. But I'm talking here about emotional integrity. Don't lie to your partner. Don't be in denial. If you want a good relationship, be upfront and forthright about your emotions. That doesn't mean you have to talk about something before you're ready. But at least say, yes, there is something bothering me, and I just don't feel like talking about it right now. Well, I want to talk about it right now. Well, then go talk to yourself. Your partner doesn't get to tell you when to talk about something, but at least be honest if there's something bothering you, and hopefully you'll deal with it in good time. Just don't play the nothing game or no, I don't know what you're talking about. When you damn well know there's something bothering you and what it is, be honest about it. Save yourself years cumulatively. Number eight, look, you got to decide to make yourself happy rather than right. This world is full of right fighters. People that just decide, look, I'm right about this. I'm just right by God. I'm right. I got the right to say this. I, I'm, I'm right about it. There's nothing going to change my mind. I saw such a tragic example of this many years ago when I was in private practice. I was working with a family, and there was a father that had a teenage son. The son wanted to grow his hair long, and the father just wasn't having it. And, you know, the kid had grown his hair out, and he kind of kept it hidden a lot until he, all of a sudden his dad realized that he was, in his dad's words, had become a long-haired hippie. I remember we were having a family session, and he said, boy, you're going to get you a damn haircut. And the kid said, I don't want to get a haircut. You know, my attitude about those things when I worked with families and my attitude about it now is when you're talking about hair or style, you got to pick your battles. These things come and go. I mean, if a kid wants to dye his hair bright green, just Take a breath, because next week they'll shave it off or it'll be a different color or something. I mean, what difference does it make? They want to grow it long? You know, wait a couple weeks. They'll shave it off into a mohawk. You go, oh, my God, that's even worse. Well, hang on. That'll go away, too. Next thing they'll know, they'll get a bear haircut, and it'll be something else. They'll have polka dots on their head. But that all goes away. Pick your battles. Kids go through fashion, and they go through hairstyles and stuff. And it's nothing permanent. It's not going to make any difference. Pick your battles. I'm telling his dad privately, look, lighten up about this, man. I have the right. He's my son. He's a minor. I have the right to tell him how I want him to wear his hair. Yes, you do. You have the right, but you want to be right or you want to be happy? Why don't you roll with it? Come on, tease him about it or something. But Have fun with it, you know? Tease them about it. Do something, but just don't throw the hoe handle down here and have a showdown and get resentment. You're going to push him into rebellious behavior and all of that. I'd love to tell you that I had great therapeutic breakthrough, but I didn't. He was just a hammerhead, and he wasn't going to listen. He was just right. I got the right to do it, and he's not going to make the decisions here. I'm the father. He's the son. I'm going to tell him what to do. Well, we'll talk about it next week. That was on a Wednesday. His son played on the junior varsity basketball team. His name was JB. He was a good basketball player. He was point guard. They were at the game, the junior varsity basketball team. His son was bringing the ball down in the second half of the basketball game, and he crossed midcourt. He just stumbled and fell, just did a face plan on the court. And nobody could figure out what happened. Did he slip on somebody's sweat and it was slick or whatever? And he, he fell down. And they blew the whistle and he didn't get up right away. So they went out there and checked him. Trainers came out and coach came out and they turned him over. They determined later that he was dead when he hit the ground. His heart just exploded when he was running down the court. It was a congenital defect that had not been diagnosed. And when he was running down the court, the demand on the heart, it just exploded. He died in the one second between stumbling and hitting the floor. And his dad has had to live with their last interactions being, by God, you're going to get a haircut because I say you are. And I've got the right to do that. 
He told me many times after that that he wished he had listened and picked his battles differently, that he wished he could ruffle up his son's long hair and tease him about it or joke about it, how he remembers him running down the court with that hair flowing and how athletic he looked and everything and how he wished he had a chance to do it over. He was right, but he sure wasn't happy. And my point is, you got to pick your battles. Do you want to be right in this relationship or do you want to be happy? The things that you think you're so right about, and maybe you are right, do they really matter in the grand scheme of things? Do they really, really matter? You know, I said I was raised by an alcoholic father. The last year and a half, almost two years of his life, he quit drinking and enrolled in the Dallas Seminary and got his Master's of Divinity. He died sober. He actually died teaching a Sunday school class. When he started the Sunday school class at this particular church, there were 10 people in his class. The morning he died, there were about 350. Class had grown that much because he was such a great communicator. We had some interesting talks in the last year and a half or two years, because they're making up for lost time, I guess, all the years that he was drunk. He used to talk about hearing God's voice, that you know God will speak to you, and you'll hear his voice, and he'll tell you what to do with your life. I used to tell him, well, that's good in theory, but I don't think I hear God's voice. And he would say, well, as seldom as you talk to him, I don't wonder that you don't recognize his voice. I was like, well, that's real funny. But you know, he said you get a lot of signals in life that will give you wake-up calls. And he said you want to be real careful to listen very closely and watch very closely if you get kind of that little tap on the shoulder, a little wake-up call from God. Because if you don't pay attention to the little tap on the shoulder, you just might get a real rap on the head. And I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well... You know from being a therapist that people only think they've got problems until they really do. You know, he was exactly right. So we were talking about is you have people in there and they're fighting just to the death. I mean, they're yelling and screaming and just willing to go to the wall over who's right about finances or who's right about parenting or who's right about where this child should go to a private school or a public school. And they're just in there fighting tooth and nail. And they come in the next week, and they found a spot on that child's kidney. And it's malignant. And all of a sudden, they don't give a tinker's damn about whether he goes to a public school or a private school, or how long their hair is, or who's parenting right or who's parenting wrong. That's what he means, is you only think you got problems until you do. So don't spend too much time worrying about being right and waste time that you could spend being happy. There's just two things left I want to say about really giving your relationship a chance to be happy. Number nine, allow your relationship to transcend the turmoil. This is real simple. And I'll use Robin and I as an example. We've been married 43 years and we have never spoken the D word in our home despite what you may have heard in the tabloids and all the clickbait stories that you see. We have never spoken the divorce word in our home, not in passing, not in an argument, not in any way have we spoken that word. And I'll tell you why. We decided a long time ago that no matter what disagreements we have, no matter what kind of arguments we have, the relationship is just simply not the stakes for which we are playing. There's no emotional extortion. It's never like, you know, you want to argue with me and this get all upset, then fine. I'll just get my stuff and leave. No, it's not the deal. We both know no matter what gets said, no matter what the argument may be or the disagreement may be, the relationship is just not on the line. That's just not table stakes. That's not what we're playing for. Think about a river and there's a branch of a tree that reaches out over the river. You can get in the river and splash around, but you cannot splash high enough to get that branch wet. It's just too high above the river. 
Well, that's our marriage. Now, we can get down there in the river, and we can splash around, argue, and splash water on each other, and we can thrash around, but it doesn't matter how much you thrash around, it is not going to splash up on that branch, because that's where our marriage is, and that's not going to get wet. That sits up above the turmoil. The relationship is never the stakes for which we play, so it doesn't ever come into play. So no matter how mad one of us may get or what one of us may say, nobody ever enters that conversation thinking, well, how bad is this going to get? Is this going to end the relationship? Is this going to be the conversation that ends it? And the answer to that is no. Never happened because we've understood and have the integrity that that's not going to be part of it. That's just not the stakes for which we play. And I highly recommend that. We deal with things as they come up, so we've never had a disagreement that even remotely approached that. We deal with things while they're small before they get big. We might have a lot of little skirmishes or disagreements and no wars. And that's what happens if you deal with things when they come up. They don't have a chance to fester and build into big things. People ask us, do we argue or have disagreements? Of course we do. But there are a lot of little small things, day-to-day things, because we just don't let them build up for a month or two months, and then there's a blow-up. But even if they did, the relationship is not something that would be on the line. It's not something for which you ever should play. Number 10 really refers to the first nine, and that is put motion into your emotions. Put motion into your emotions. Everything that I've just been talking about, own your relationship, accept the risk of vulnerability, accept your partner, be a good friend, promote their self-esteem, don't vent your frustrations at home, be up front and forthright, make yourself happy, not right. All of these things, these are action steps, things that you need to do differently. Put these things into motion. It doesn't do any good to just feel differently. You have to behave differently. And I promise you, when you do, you will no longer be eliciting, maintaining, or allowing destructive behavior from your partner. You will be creating an environment that is really fertile for health. If you do things that makes your partner feel better about who they are, I promise you things are going to feel better at home. I promise you your relationship is going to be more healthy, more rewarding. I really hope these things are thought-provoking. I really hope you put them into play. All of this is going to be on our website, so you can go back and review it if you haven't been taking notes because you've been driving or walking or whatever. So the 10 things that I've listed here are all going to be on the website so you can go back and grade your own paper. I really want you to do that. Because when I say this is relationship reality check, you really do need to check. Because when somebody asks you how much fun are you to live with, I want you to kind of get a little devilish grin on your face and say, yeah, I'm a hell of a lot of fun to live with. I'm Dr. Phil. Phil.